The administration of justice in late Anglo-Saxon England was intricately woven into the fabric of society. Its foundation rested upon the Shire Court, a biannual assembly presided over by the Ealdorman and Bishop. This court served as the primary forum for legal matters within the Shire, with the sheriff assuming direct responsibility for maintaining law and order. The sheriff, acting as the king's representative, oversaw the operation of local hundred courts, which convened every four weeks and held jurisdiction over minor offenses. In addition to these formal judicial bodies, manor courts possessed delegated authority to handle even less serious transgressions, ensuring a comprehensive system of justice that reached every corner of society. The medieval period witnessed a gradual formalization of justice, with clearly defined roles and responsibilities for handling different levels of crime. The royal courts, with their judges appointed by the crown, acquired jurisdiction over all felonies, marking a significant shift in the administration of justice. This centralized system, known as the common law, extended its reach across the entire realm, establishing a uniform legal framework that transcended regional boundaries. Even the Palatinates of Chester and Durham, where bishops wielded powers traditionally associated with princes, and later Lancaster, remained subject to the common law, reinforcing its overarching authority. Henry of Bratton, better known as Bracton, a prominent legal scholar of the 13th century, penned a seminal work entitled On the Laws and Customs of England, which provided a comprehensive explanation of the common law. This work, along with the laws passed by Parliament, collectively known as statute law, continually expanded and refined the legal corpus, meticulously differentiating between various levels of crime. Common law classified offenses into two categories, felonies, representing serious crimes and misdemeanors, or trespasses in medieval parlance, considered less severe. The Middle Ages recognized a range of crimes categorized as felonies, including murder, rape, robbery, theft of goods exceeding five pence in value, and arson. These grave offenses were met with the ultimate punishment, hanging. Royal judges also addressed a variety of trespasses, encompassing offenses such as assault, and by the 14th century, violations related to contracts, wages, and prices. The absence of a formal police force in the medieval period led to the emergence of juries of presentment, a crucial mechanism for law enforcement. These juries, composed of sworn members of the community, bore the responsibility of accusing individuals suspected of committing crimes within their locality. This system replaced an earlier reliance on private prosecutions, and by the year 1400, it had become the primary source of prosecutions, signifying a significant shift in the administration of justice. A cornerstone of local justice administration was the Frank Pledge system a concept with roots in late Anglo-Saxon times. This system mandated that all freemen, excluding clergy and knights, join a tithing, a group of ten men collectively responsible for the conduct of each other. If one member of a tithing was accused of a crime, the remaining members were obligated to bring the accused before justice or compensate the injured party. The manorial court leet held the responsibility of verifying membership in a tithing, a process known as the View of Frank Pledge. Any man found not to be a member of a tithing was subjected to a fine, the proceeds of which went to the lord of the manor. This system served as a crucial bridge between the regulation of petty local offenses and more serious crimes, effectively offloading responsibility from central government to local lords. This delegation of responsibility created an incentive for local lords to actively participate in the administration of the system as it yielded them financial gain. Manorial court records from Weston, Hertfordshire in 1340 provide a detailed insight into the multifaceted responsibilities of the Frank Pledge system. These records highlight the need to account for all members of a tithing, ensure that all individuals aged 12 years and over were part of a tithing, investigate the occurrence of hue and cry, determine if blood had been shed and identify the perpetrators, identify instances of trespassing, such as placing dung heaps on the street or plowing on a neighbor's land, name those accused of theft, identify receivers of stolen goods and counterfeiters of coins, record instances of rape, document the discovery of treasure, and investigate the use of false weights and measures. 
This comprehensive list underscores the wide scope of the Frank Pledge system, its intricate connection to local life, and the vital role it played in maintaining order and justice within medieval communities. Positioned below the royal courts, administering the common law, and the intermediate layer of the Frank Pledge system, were the manorial courts. These courts enforced the customary rules and obligations specific to local manners, imposing fines on offenders. Manorial courts served as platforms for disputes not only between the lord of the manor and tenants, but also among tenants themselves. Court records reveal instances where tenants brought complaints against each other, highlighting the court's role in resolving local disputes. In one instance, in 1331, Thomas de Toadhill successfully brought a complaint against a neighbor for allowing his dogs to kill six of his pigs. In another case, John Packard was fined for failing to pay a fine of 13 shillings and 4 pence, owed due to his wife Alice striking Marjorie, the wife of William Wodebite, which resulted in drawing blood. Court records from Downham, Cambridgeshire in 1311 document the case of William Bunting, who was forced to compensate Peter Gill two shillings for beating and ill-treating him. These cases illustrate the practical application of manorial justice in everyday life, resolving disputes between tenants, enforcing customary regulations, and ensuring the smooth functioning of local communities. The complex and multifaceted administration of justice in late Anglo-Saxon and medieval England was a testament to the evolving legal and social landscape of the era. The Shire Court, Hundred Courts, Manorial Courts, and the Frank Pledge system collectively formed a comprehensive network of legal institutions that addressed a wide range of offenses, from minor misdemeanors to serious felonies. The gradual formalization of the legal system, the introduction of the common law, and the development of juries of presentment all contributed to a more sophisticated and centralized approach to justice. While the medieval period was characterized by a lack of a formal police force, Local communities played a crucial role in maintaining order and upholding the law. Through the active participation of individuals in tithings and the vigilance of manorial courts. The administration of justice, woven into the fabric of everyday life, served as a vital mechanism for resolving disputes, enforcing customary regulations, and ensuring the stability and security of medieval society. The English legal system in the Middle Ages was a complex tapestry woven from various strands, each contributing to the administration of justice within the realm. While the common law, with its royal courts and judges, dominated the realm, another distinct legal system, canon law, existed in parallel, operating within the framework of the church. Canon law, prevalent throughout Western Europe, was administered in church courts, primarily addressing matters concerning the clergy, but also extending its influence to the laity. These courts held authority over crucial aspects of lay life, including the payment of tithes, sexual misconduct, the validity of marriages, wills, heresy, and witchcraft. The existence of two distinct legal systems often created friction. This tension was most evident when clergy members were accused of serious crimes. Instead of facing the rigors of royal justice, they were tried in church courts, where punishments were often more lenient. This practice, known as benefit of clergy, allowed individuals to claim exemption from royal justice by asserting their status as members of the clergy. This claim was often substantiated through the recitation of a biblical passage in Latin, a practice open to exploitation. Anyone, regardless of their actual clerical status, could claim to be a member of the clergy if they possessed the ability to read or memorize a biblical passage, rendering this system vulnerable to abuse. The dispute between Henry II and Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, in the 12th century, exemplifies the conflict surrounding this exemption. At the heart of this dispute was the question of whether clergy should enjoy immunity from royal justice for crimes committed by their lay counterparts. While benefit of clergy was eventually restricted, allowing lay persons to claim it only once, its applicability to serious crimes, including murder, kept the controversy alive. Church courts employed a range of punishments, including public whippings in the earlier centuries and, more commonly, public penance. This penance often involved standing in the marketplace in undergarments, holding a lighted candle, 
serving as a public display of contrition. Despite the equality of men and women before the law in church courts, the unfermained excluded, reflecting a broader societal hierarchy. The limitations on women's legal agency were even more pronounced. Their legal actions were largely restricted to the prosecution of their husband's murders, but only if the death occurred in their arms. Women could also pursue legal action for the loss of an unborn child and for rape. However, Article 54 of Magna Carta explicitly stated, No one shall be arrested or imprisoned on the appeal of a woman for the death of any person except her husband. This provision highlights the limited legal rights of women in medieval England, further solidified by the low likelihood of successful prosecution in rape cases. The assumption that conception could only occur with mutual sexual pleasure contributed to the difficulty of bringing rape charges against perpetrators. This was particularly true if pregnancy ensued, reinforcing the subordinate status of women. This subservient status could, conversely, work to a woman's advantage if she was accused of complicity in her husband's crimes. The prevailing logic held that if a woman acted on her husband's instructions, he bore the blame, as she was bound to obey him. This legal principle reflected the entrenched patriarchal norms of the era. By 1250, two Supreme Courts emerged, the Court of Common Pleas and the Court of King's Bench. While the Court of Common Pleas, typically convened in Westminster, dealt with property disputes, the Court of King's Bench, initially meant to travel with the King, also primarily sat in Westminster, handling felonies and appeals from lower courts. Accessing the Court of Common Pleas demanded significant financial resources. First, individuals needed to pay for the issuance of a writ, a formal document identifying the complaint, naming the defendant, and compelling their appearance before the court. Then, they had to pay for an attorney to present their case before the royal judges. This process made justice a luxury, attainable only for those who could afford it. Beyond the established courts, royal judges embarked on tours known as ears, traveling to different regions to administer justice. These tours, initially intended to occur every seven years, were later replaced with local assize judges and commissions of Oyer and Terminer after 1294. Assize judges traversed circuits of adjacent counties, handling offenses that occurred within their jurisdiction since their last visit, with scheduled sittings at least three times a year. Commissions of Oyer and Terminer were dispatched to swiftly address local disturbances and abuses of power. Similar to these commissions, the Commission of Trailbaston was established to combat the organized criminal activities of armed gangs. While these commissions aimed to address local lawlessness, they were frequently accused of corruption and arbitrary decision-making. The failure to effectively curb the activities of organized criminal gangs, such as the Fallvilles and the Coterals, highlights the limitations of these commissions. During the late 13th century, keepers of the peace were appointed with some policing responsibilities. By 1400, these individuals evolved into local justices of the peace, first formally recognized in 1361. These justices of the peace convened at least four times a year in quarter sessions, handling less serious offenses. They became vital local agents of the Crown and Parliament, assuming responsibility for fixing wages and prices, constructing and regulating roads and bridges, and overseeing local services deemed essential for the welfare of the country. The long-standing nature of these institutions is reflected in the fact that quarter sessions remained in place until 1972, a testament to their resilience and adaptability over time. Early justices of the peace were granted a subsistence allowance of four shillings a day by a law enacted in 1389. However, this allowance soon lapsed as most justices of the peace were drawn from the local elite, wealthy landowners who could manage without financial assistance. This underscores the inherent class-based nature of the administration of justice, where access to power and resources played a significant role. The English legal system in the Middle Ages was a complex and dynamic entity, reflecting the evolving social and political landscape of the era. While the common law and canon law operated in parallel, often creating tensions, they collectively provided a framework for the administration of justice. The emergence of royal courts, juries of presentment, and various commissions aimed at combating local lawlessness were essential elements of the legal system. 
However, the system was not without its flaws. The influence of social hierarchy, the limitations on women's legal rights, and the vulnerability of the system to corruption were persistent challenges. Despite these limitations, the medieval legal system, with its evolving institutions and procedures, served as the foundation for the development of the modern English legal system. The medieval justice system, despite its evolving nature and the gradual formalization of legal processes, held a surprising aversion to imprisonment. The concept of prison as a primary form of punishment is largely a modern invention, emerging in the latter half of the 18th century and gaining prominence in the early 19th century. It wasn't until 1576 that justices of the peace were mandated to construct houses of correction for the detention of rogues and vagabonds. These individuals were apprehended by village constables, unpaid members of their local parish, who were conscripted annually for this duty. Prior to this, punishment relied heavily on execution, other forms of physical violence, outlawry, and fines. Medieval prisons primarily served as holding places for individuals awaiting trial, rather than being the primary means of punishment. London, in 1475, saw a significant shift in the procedures surrounding the trial of prisoners. The practice of gale delivery, traditionally held once a year, was increased to at least five times annually. This change undoubtedly brought a sense of relief to prisoners awaiting their trials, tried shortening the duration of their confinement. Despite the limited role of prisons in punishment, they did exist in medieval England. One of the most renowned examples was Clink Prison, established in the 12th century under the authority of the Bishop of Winchester in Southwark, located on the south side of London Bridge. The bishop constructed separate prisons for men and women in this area, now known as Bankside. The location of the prison reflects both the bishop's authority and the inherent criminality of the area. Southwark, with its complex social and legal landscape, housed inns, public gardens, and was a fashionable residence for prominent figures. By the end of the 13th century, numerous townhouses belonging to powerful churchmen and nobles were situated south of the Thames, granting them easy access to Westminster. Sir John Fastolf, renowned for his exploits in the French Wars, was a notable resident of Southwark, owning a considerable establishment there during the 14th century. Even more imposing was the Bishop of Winchester's residence, located just west of the bridgehead. Southwark's history was marked by the growth of lay and ecclesiastical franchises, which claimed independence from royal justice. This autonomy offered privileged positions to landowners, but also provided sanctuary to fugitive criminals and debtors, contributing to the area's criminal activity. In several cases, land leased from the church in Southwark was used for stews or brothels, due to their location beyond the stricter control of royal authority or the city of London, situated north of the Thames. This practice applied to land owned by the Bishop of Winchester and the prioress and nuns of St. Leonard's Priory, Stratford at Bow. The bitter jibe of Duke Humphrey to his uncle Cardinal Beaufort, Bishop of Winchester from 1404 to 1447, in Shakespeare's Henry V Part I, Thou that givest whores indulgences to sin, reflects the perception of Southwark as a haven for illicit activities. One of the reasons for the limited use of prisons as punishment was the prevalence of capital punishment. This reality is revealed in the often overlooked area of medieval execution cemeteries. While individuals in mid to late Anglo-Saxon England predominantly sought burial in cemeteries around churches, a distinct burial practice emerged, characterized by the interment of individuals outside community cemeteries. This practice, known as deviant burials, gained particular significance after 850, when community cemeteries were increasingly considered hallowed ground due to their proximity to Christian places of worship. This proximity signified a shared Christian community encompassing both the living and the dead, with their mortal remains buried near a church, awaiting the last judgment. The exclusion of certain burials, their placement in separate locations, highlights a deliberate social distinction a recognition of deviancy by contemporaries. From the middle to later Anglo-Saxon period, extending into the 12th century, both small and large execution cemeteries existed. Characteristic deviant burials, 
where bodies displayed signs of violence or unusual orientations, were discovered near Mound 5 at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk. This once elite burial ground had become taboo due to its use in pagan times, contributing to the choice of this location for deviant burials. Another striking example was the discovery of a beheaded individual buried at Stonehenge in Wiltshire. Radiocarbon dating in 2001 initially placed the burial between 600 and 690, though this date has since been revised, suggesting a possible date as late as 890. Similarly, archaeologists excavating a large Bronze Age round barrow at South Acre in Norfolk found evidence of its reuse in the Anglo-Saxon period, with over 100 secondary burials, many in shallow graves. Several graves contained multiple burials, and none showed signs of ceremonial placement. The absence of children and the predominance of young adults, along with the discovery of decapitation, burial facing into the earth, and bound bodies, strongly suggest the presence of a Quelmstow, an execution place. Many of these sites were located at the boundaries of hundreds and shires, serving as locations for both the execution and burial of excommunicated criminals. It is highly likely that many references to heathen burials found on charter boundaries relate to these execution cemeteries rather than to burial grounds from the pre-Christian era. Archaeological evidence and charters indicate that the separation of criminals and social outcasts from community cemeteries became widespread in England by the 10th century. There are hints suggesting that drowning was sometimes employed as a method of execution and disposal of the body, possibly linked to the belief that water acted as a barrier to ghosts. During the 11th century, the practice of burying criminals at boundaries began to shift, with certain monastic orders claiming the bodies of criminals for burial. The Knights Hospitaller were most frequently associated with this practice. These burials sometimes took place in parish churchyards or in the churchyards of the order, such as the Pardon Churchyard in Clerkenwell, London. Examples of Hospitallers claiming the bodies of executed criminals are found in locations as diverse as Ilchester in Somerset, Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, and York. Throughout the Middle Ages, the death penalty was applied to a broad range of offenses including property crimes, where stolen items exceeded the value of 12 pence. This applied to individuals over the age of 10, marking the age at which children were considered criminally responsible. Hanging was the most common method of execution. Although a woman found guilty of murdering her husband could be burned at the stake, considered petty treason. The absence of prisons as a prominent form of punishment in medieval England in contrast to the prevalence of execution and other forms of physical punishment, highlights the distinct nature of justice in that era. The development of execution cemeteries, with their distinct burial practices, further underscores the societal anxieties surrounding deviancy and the importance of maintaining social order. The gradual shift from burial at boundaries to the claim of executed criminals by monastic orders, particularly the Knights Hospitaller, suggests a complex evolution in attitudes towards death and punishment. While the medieval legal system was often harsh, its reliance on capital punishment, alongside the absence of extensive imprisonment, reveals a unique approach to justice, shaped by religious beliefs, social anxieties, and evolving legal practices. The study of medieval law and order compels us to confront a crucial question. Just how criminal were the Middle Ages? While criminality fluctuated across the period, its prevalence was surprisingly high. Murder rates in 14th century East Anglia rivaled those of modern-day New York and England as a whole, witnessed a far higher homicide rate than contemporary urban America. Evidence from traditional rural peasant communities such as pre-collectivization Russia in the late 1920s reveals a pervasive culture of violence, often stemming from domestic disputes, particularly involving male aggression against women and children, as well as inter-neighbor conflicts. The scenario from 1312, where Robert of Starston in Norfolk threatened his brother Thomas with a knife over a land dispute, only to be killed by Thomas with a cart shaft, highlights the volatile nature of these conflicts. Bruce Campbell points out that these acts of violence between tenants were often related to the scarcity of land in Norfolk at the time, receiving less attention in medieval records than conflicts between tenants and landlords, 
as they did not pose a direct threat to the established social order. A peasant killing another was a crime, but did not challenge the dominance of the local elites. The evidence suggests a casual and easy resort to violence, encompassing minor fistfights, assaults with sticks, pitchforks, and knives, as documented in manorial court rolls, but also culminating in murder. While this widespread violence underscores the brutal nature of medieval life, specific events seem to have triggered significant spikes in crime. One such trigger was the return of Edward III's army from the Siege of Calais in 1347, followed by the return of soldiers from broader campaigns in France in 1361. The scale of the problem prompted local justices of the peace to implement measures forcing returning soldiers into employment to prevent their descent into criminal activity. While detailed records are lacking, it is likely that crime rates fluctuated at other times due to similar wartime circumstances. The conduct of these returning soldiers in England sheds light on the appalling impact of English military adventures on French communities during the Hundred Years' War. Often overshadowed by the heroic narratives of battles like Crecy and Agincourt. In between these grand battles, common soldiers were engaged in widespread looting, rape, and murder of defenseless French civilians. War contributed to increased crime in other ways. Elevated taxation and forced sales of provisions for the army disrupted commercial activities, pushing middlemen to demand cash from their debtors, who were often at the lower end of the social scale. This trend is evident after the Scottish victory over the English in 1314 and the resumption of war with France in 1337. The pressure created by these events resulted in impoverished peasants selling tiny plots of land to meet their debts. The period between 1315 and 1321 saw an alarming increase in begging and theft as people struggled for survival and crimes against property surged. For extended periods, the unsettled conditions on the northern border with Scotland provided a breeding ground for criminal activities, often disguised as acts of war, with perpetrators escaping punishment. While specific circumstances like war contributed to surges in crime, economic downturns and other social and economic factors played a more persistent role, mirroring modern societal trends. The structure of the medieval economy exacerbated this tendency, as some historians have observed, with a market economy coexisting with subsistence-level production, a combination ripe for instability and danger. For many living on the brink of destitution, petty crime often became a tempting means of survival during economic recessions. Court records indicate that the period around 1300, marked by economic distress, saw a surge in petty crime. A strong correlation has been established between years of poor harvests and women stealing food and clothing. The punishment for stealing items worth more than 12 pence was hanging, highlighting the severity of the legal response to such acts of desperation. The turbulent years of the late 14th century, marked by economic decline and societal anxieties, saw a further increase in crime. The House of Commons, in 1376, petitioned for stricter penalties against vagrants, one of many such petitions related to falling grain prices and the dismissal of numerous agricultural laborers by landlords. This rise in mobile workers, often associated with increased crime, alarmed the propertied classes. This pattern echoes the Elizabethan laws against vagrancy during another economic downturn in the late 16th century. The problem of vagrancy persisted, leading to further laws against them in 1414 and 1446. The Vagrancy Act of 1495 stipulated that beggars should be arrested, placed in the stocks for three days, and then returned to their original place of residence. Local authorities adopted similar measures. In 1500, city authorities in Gloucester mandated the registration of all beggars, and in 1504 expelled most from the city. In 1515, the authorities in York issued official badges to beggars deemed legitimate due to illness or injury, differentiating them from those perceived as work-shy and a social nuisance. The medieval legal system, like any human institution, was susceptible to abuse. Royal justices were accused of corruption, with Sir Thomas Willoughby, the victim of the Fulville gang's kidnapping, himself facing accusations of selling laws as if they had been oxen or cattle. 
This speaks volumes about the potential for corruption and the vulnerability of the justice system to manipulation by those in power. The system of canon law, with its allowance for lay people to claim exemption from royal justice by reciting a memorized Latin verse from the Bible, further exemplified this potential for abuse. This practice, while intended to protect the clergy, could be exploited by individuals seeking to escape punishment for serious crimes, highlighting the flaws in the legal system's design. Furthermore, the cost of litigation created an unequal playing field, allowing wealthy landowners to financially cripple their rivals by bringing frivolous land disputes to court. The Paston family of East Anglia, famous for their surviving letters, found themselves entangled in such a bitter dispute with Lord Molines over ownership of the Manor of Gresham. Both sides resorted to violence at various points to gain control of the property, underscoring the intensity and danger of these disputes. In 1449, Margaret, John Paston's wife, wrote to him, requesting crossbows, arrows, almonds, sugar, and cloth for a gown for their child, illustrating the precariousness of their situation and the need for both weaponry and everyday necessities in the midst of this violent land dispute. The Paston family's ongoing legal battles with their neighbors over a wall encroaching on their land further demonstrate the pervasiveness of these conflicts, even on a smaller scale. Agnes, John Paston's mother, wrote to him in 1451, detailing how neighbors had pushed down a portion of the disputed wall, highlighting the constant threat of violence and intimidation inherent in these disputes. While the medieval legal system was fairly effective in protecting property rights and titles, it was far less effective in addressing crimes of violence against the person. Rape, in particular, was rarely punished, and this ineffectiveness was exacerbated when the accused were well-connected, able to intimidate jurors or bribe judges. The lack of modern forensic techniques made detection incredibly challenging, and successful prosecutions often relied on catching criminals in the act or securing accusations from individuals with first-hand knowledge of the crime. Court records offer insight into the types of cases where justice was more readily applied. The case of Wakelin, who killed Matilda Day with a knife, provides a stark example. He was caught in the act with a blood-stained knife, and the village and 12 jurors confirmed his guilt, leaving no room for denial. He was sentenced to be hanged. However, even with careful investigation, successful prosecution depended on the ability to locate and persuade witnesses to come forward. In 1248, a gang responsible for robbing two foreign merchants in Alton was eventually tracked down, and several members were hanged. Similarly, the individuals who attacked and robbed Geoffrey Chaucer at New Cross in 1390 were apprehended. Both of these crimes involved members of the elite who were well positioned to exert pressure on authorities to pursue the perpetrators. The duty of any citizen who witnessed a crime was to raise the hue and cry, which obligated others who heard the alarm to join in and attempt to apprehend the offender. Falsely raising the hue and cry against another was punishable by a fine, as evidenced by Agnes Bridge, who was fined three pence in 1385 for wrongly accusing John Fulsham. Determining guilt or innocence presented a significant challenge for the medieval legal system. Early methods relied on trials by ordeal and trials by combat, both designed to test innocence through divine intervention. Trials by ordeal involved subjecting defendants to severe physical tests, such as handling a hot object. The state of the wound after three days, with healing indicating innocence, determined the outcome. Trials by combat pitted the defendant and accuser against each other in battle, with victory signifying divine approval. While trials by ordeal were abolished in 1215 and trials by combat gradually declined, they weren't formally abolished until 1819. The alternative system relied on the testimony of neighbors, requiring the accused to secure the sworn oaths of individuals vouching for their good behavior and character. However, this system was inherently flawed. Past actions were not a guarantee of present innocence, and the procedure relied on the defendant's social connections and ability to secure favorable testimony. During the 13th century, the system of oath swearers evolved into the more effective system of trial by jury. This system combined elements of previous methods aiming for a more neutral and effective approach. 
local juries, supposedly selected from reliable individuals, swore to reach a verdict based on local knowledge of events and reputations. This system, when properly implemented, could be effective. For instance, Henry of Bretby, who killed his son while they were plowing, was judged innocent by a local jury who knew both men well and believed the death to be an accident. The jury declared that they know for a truth that Henry would rather have killed himself than his only son. The increasing reliance on juries and the examination of evidence is reflected in Magna Carta, Article 38, which states, In future, no official shall place a man on trial upon his own unsupported statement, without producing credible witnesses to the truth of it. Article 39 further underscores the importance of due process and trial by one's peers. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned, or stripped of his rights or possessions, or outlawed or exiled, or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him, or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. However, the medieval legal system, despite its advancements, faced significant challenges. The severity of the law itself presented a problem prompting juries to understate the value of stolen goods to avoid the death penalty. Pardons also introduced a layer of complexity. By the mid-14th century, violent criminals were frequently granted royal pardons in exchange for military service in the French wars. Charters of pardon could also be purchased, allowing the crown to raise money while undermining the integrity of the justice system. This practice, a form of corruption originating at the highest level, sheds further light on the problematic behavior of members of the English army in France and their subsequent return to England. The medieval legal system, though striving for fairness and justice, was often hampered by corruption, unequal access, and the potential for manipulation by the wealthy and powerful. The reliance on trials by ordeal and combat, while gradually replaced by juries and the examination of evidence, highlights the evolution of legal practices and the quest for a more reliable system of determining guilt or innocence. Despite its limitations, the medieval legal system provided a framework for maintaining order and resolving disputes, while reflecting the inherent challenges of achieving justice in a complex and often turbulent society. The legend of Robin Hood has become so deeply ingrained in our collective consciousness that it's difficult to contemplate medieval criminality without conjuring up his romanticized, almost mythical image. His story, with its themes of social justice, defiance of authority, and redistribution of wealth, has resonated across centuries, influencing our understanding of both the man and the period in which he allegedly lived. In 2007, when a British Chancellor of the Exchequer presented his budget to Parliament, the independent newspaper aptly used the Robin Hood analogy, stating, Old-style socialists liken themselves to Robin Hood by seeking to tax the rich to help the poor. But when it comes to British business, the Chancellor has become a latter-day sheriff of Nottingham. Whether or not readers agreed with the political assessment, the underlying symbolism was universally understood. Robin Hood represents the forces of good, while the Sheriff of Nottingham embodies tyranny and oppression. The enduring popularity of Robin Hood is further evident in the naming of a modern Wiltshire-based Christian charity, Robin Hood Ministries, dedicated to alleviating poverty through direct action. This choice of name reflects the organization's commitment to sharing wealth with those in need, echoing the core principles attributed to the legendary outlaw. What is particularly intriguing is that a 15th century audience would have understood the reference equally well. The first poem celebrating Robin Hood's deeds, Robin Hood and the Monk, emerged in 1450, and contemporary records reveal that dressing up as Robin Hood was a popular choice for rural communities during May Games, events where they collected money for their local churches. The enduring popularity of the Robin Hood figure, both in the 15th century and today, prompts us to examine his origins and explore the broader cultural significance of his legend. What does the rise of Robin Hood tell us about popular attitudes towards law and order and the definition of crime in the Middle Ages? Examining the historical origins of the Robin Hood legend reveals a complex and contested narrative. Professor James Holt, 
has conducted an extensive analysis of the available evidence, shedding light on the elusive outlaw's origins. The earliest securely datable reference to a criminal named Robert Hodd, potentially the original Robin Hood, dates back to the York Assizes of June 25, 1225. In that year, the king's judges ordered the seizure of Robert Hodd's goods, labeling him a fugitive. A year later, another record refers to this action, but this time the outlaw is given the more colloquial name of Habahad. While it's impossible to definitively determine if this Robert Hodd was the original Robin Hood, the record provides no further information about his crimes, methods, or location of activities. However, it is clear that within a span of approximately 50 years, the name Robin Hood became increasingly prevalent as a chosen moniker for numerous criminals. The fact that individuals adopted the entire name as a surname suggests that they viewed it as an appropriate tag for themselves and their activities. Several examples further illustrate this trend. In 1262, William Robohod in Berkshire was accused of membership in an outlaw gang and robbery. In 1272, John Rabinhod in Hampshire was charged with murder. In 1272, Alexander Robohod in Essex was accused of theft. In 1286, Gilbert Robohod in Suffolk faced unspecified charges. In 1294, Robert Robohod in Hampshire was accused of sheep stealing. These cases, though limited in detail, indicate a growing association of the name Robin Hood with criminal activities, suggesting a perception of the outlaw as a symbol of defiance against authority, particularly during a period of political and economic upheaval. It's worth noting that the Robin Hood legend, as it emerged in the 15th century, portrayed him as a charismatic and noble figure who fought for social justice and the rights of the poor, stealing from the wealthy, and distributing the spoils among the downtrodden. However, the historical evidence suggests a more complex and nuanced reality, where the name Robin Hood was adopted by a range of individuals engaged in various criminal activities. This discrepancy between the romanticized legend and the historical reality speaks volumes about the power of storytelling and the ability of popular narratives to shape our understanding of history. Several factors likely contributed to the emergence and enduring appeal of the Robin Hood legend. First, the prevalence of outlaw gangs in medieval England, particularly during periods of social unrest and economic hardship, provided fertile ground for such a figure. These gangs often operated in defiance of authority, targeting the wealthy and powerful while seeking to protect or empower the marginalized. Robin Hood, as a symbol of this resistance, resonated with the aspirations of the lower classes who felt burdened by oppressive laws and societal inequalities. Secondly, the Robin Hood legend offered a powerful counter-narrative to the prevailing narratives of power and authority. The image of a noble outlaw who stood up for the downtrodden and challenged the injustices of the ruling class, appealed to those who felt disenfranchised and marginalized by the established social order. This narrative resonated with a yearning for social justice, a desire for a more equitable distribution of wealth and power, and a longing for a world where those who lacked privilege could find a voice and champion their rights. Furthermore, the Robin Hood legend tapped into a deeply ingrained cultural understanding of the forest as a place of freedom and escape. The forest, a symbol of wildness and untamed nature, offered refuge from the constraints of societal norms and provided a space for those who sought to live outside the confines of the established order. The image of Robin Hood residing in Sherwood Forest, a mythical haven for outlaws, reinforced the symbolic association of the forest with rebellion and freedom. The enduring popularity of the Robin Hood legend highlights the enduring appeal of stories that champion social justice and challenge power structures. While the historical reality may be more complex and less romanticized, the legend continues to resonate with audiences because it speaks to deeply held human values and aspirations. The Robin Hood story reminds us of the enduring need for social justice, the inherent power of resistance, and the potential for individuals to champion change in the face of inequality and oppression. The legend of Robin Hood, though deeply embedded in our cultural consciousness, is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon that reflects the evolving social and political landscape of medieval England. The name itself, Robin Hood, 
appears repeatedly in historical records, often associated with individuals involved in criminal activities. These individuals, operating outside the bounds of law and authority, embraced the Robin Hood moniker, recognizing its association with defiance and a sense of justice for the downtrodden. The emergence of the name Robin Hood in historical records, beginning with the York Assizes of 1225, where a fugitive named Robert Hodd was accused of criminal activity, marks the initial stage of this legend. Over the following decades, the name Robin Hood, or variations of it, such as Robahod or Robin Hood, became increasingly prevalent, associated with individuals involved in a range of crimes, including robbery, murder, and theft. This trend highlights the pervasive nature of outlaw gangs and the common perception of Robin Hood as a figure of defiance against societal norms and oppressive authority. The 14th century witnessed a further consolidation of the Robin Hood legend within popular culture. William Langland's poem, Piers Plowman, written around 1377, includes a character named Sloth, who confesses his knowledge of rhymes of Robin Hood and Randolph, Earl of Chester. This mention of Robin Hood within a literary work signifies the growing presence of the legend in popular discourse, reflecting the widespread familiarity with his story. The 15th century saw the legend solidify, with specific details and characters emerging in various sources. In 1420, Andrew de Wintoun wrote a rhyming chronicle that mentions Little John and Robin Hood as forest outlaws operating in Inglewood and Barnsdale during the years 1283 to 1285. In the 1440s, another Scottish writer, referring to the famous murderer Robert Hood as well as Little John, placed their rise to prominence in 1266. A particularly compelling example of the Robin Hood legend's impact is found in a piece of graffiti poetry inscribed on the edge of a 1432 document listing the elected members of Parliament from Wiltshire. This graffiti, instead of listing the elected officials' names, presents a contrived message, Robin, Hode, Ina, Grenoad, Stowed, Godeman, was, he. The deliberate use of Robin Hood's name in this context reinforces the legend's pervasive presence in popular culture highlighting its ability to transcend formal records and official narratives. Analyzing these early legends reveals common recurring themes. The virtues of life in the Greenwood, a romanticized depiction of life outside the constraints of society, feature prominently. The outlaw band, with its internal conflicts and loyalties, is a recurring motif, highlighting the camaraderie and dynamics of a group living outside the law. Robin's devotion to the Virgin Mary, a surprising element given his outlaw status reveals a complex character with a spiritual dimension. The recurring narrative of Robin eventually being rewarded with a position in royal service, though not consistently present in all versions, underscores the complex relationship between outlaws and authority. The recurring use of disguise as a means to defeat enemies reinforces the theme of deception and manipulation while highlighting Robin's cunning and strategic prowess. The recurring villains, the Sheriff of Nottingham, greedy bishops and abbots, and treacherous monks reflect the common societal resentments towards corrupt officials and the perceived injustices of the established order. The depiction of Robin as a yeoman, a skilled archer and warrior, reinforces the figure of the skilled and resourceful commoner. The geographical association with South Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire with Sherwood Forest serving as his primary base of operations, further solidifies the legend's regional roots and its connection to specific landscapes. What is notably absent from these early legends is the iconic image of Robin Hood wielding a quarterstaff, his romantic relationship with Maid Marian, and any mention of King Richard the Lionheart. There is also a limited focus on oppressive taxes and Robin's role as a dispossessed nobleman with a less prominent emphasis on stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. This contrast between the early legends and the later romanticized narratives suggests a gradual evolution in the Robin Hood legend, with later interpretations emphasizing Robin's heroic nature and social justice crusade. The early Robin Hood, based on the available evidence, emerges as a more complex character. He challenges the authority of the rich and powerful, including monks, royal forest law, and the local sheriff. But he is not a revolutionary. 
he maintains reverence for the king and lacks a strong focus on social justice. There is an absence of romantic elements, with the focus instead on his role as a disruptive force, a champion of the common yeoman against those who hinder their ambitions and exploit them. The enduring popularity of Robin Hood sheds light on medieval attitudes towards crime and social justice. The early supporters of Robin Hood, while not endorsing crime as a means of achieving social justice, were drawn to the figure of the outlaw who lived by his wits and challenged the established order. They celebrated Robin's defiance, especially when his targets were figures of widespread resentment, such as local government officials and wealthy churchmen. This fascination with the outlaw also reflected a romanticized view of life in the Greenwood, a yearning for a simpler life outside the constraints of society. This perspective finds parallels in the romanticized portrayal of more modern criminals, such as Jesse James, Bonnie and Clyde, and the great train robbers. These figures, though responsible for violent crimes, are often viewed with a degree of sympathy, with their victims depicted as impersonal institutions, such as banks. This tendency to downplay or rationalize criminal actions by targeting seemingly faceless entities mirrors the medieval fascination with Robin Hood. The popularity of Robin Hood likely reflects a societal tolerance for petty criminality in an era where it was widespread, particularly when those crimes targeted individuals or institutions that were already viewed with suspicion or hostility. This perspective finds support in the case of Richard of the Kerr, who apprehended a thief stealing from him, but was willing to help himself to a shirt the thief had stolen from Robert the Leper. This demonstrates a complex and often hypocritical attitude toward crime, where the line between victim and perpetrator could be fluid and subject to individual biases and self-interest. The Robin Hood legend, with its evolving narratives and shifting interpretations, provides a rich window into medieval society, revealing both the complexities of crime and the enduring appeal of narratives that challenge authority and champion social justice. While the historical figure of Robin Hood may remain elusive, the legend itself continues to resonate across centuries offering a powerful reminder of the enduring human desires for freedom, equality, and a world where justice prevails.